through Lou mm -hmm. actually was useful. Amen. Amen. Because I think, Bobby, what you gave us was um, a, a reading of the scripture that, that would be classic, complementarian. But it was also, in my view at least, kind of stripped down biblical theology. Mm. You were just sort of giving us some straightforward planks about gender, there are two, right? Male, female. Uh, some straightforward planks about um, relationship between male and female and so on. And so I thought that was particularly helpful. Um, and, and Lou, I thought you were doing a good job of, of beginning to broach the question in various ways of kind of the cultural attachments that um, glom onto our, our theologies, uh, whether complementarian or egalitarian or neither. I, you know, we, 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 we do have these cultural attachments that glom on and, and uh, it's particularly helped by the illustration you were using uh, of sort of your earlier ministry in a predominantly African-American setting um, and the things that you've been sort of becoming aware of in, in your own sojourn. What I'd like to do is, is press us forward toward this notion of um, engaging the Bible's teaching on gender and roles um, in an attempt to sort of examine what's biblical and what's cultural, mm -hmm. right? And to do that, I just want to take us back to the sort of text that's been looming in conversations for the last couple of hours. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read this paragraph. It's not a sermon, just a thought. Well, it might be a sermon. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, Paul writes there, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man, rather she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. What struck me about this text, and, and I, I have to thank Judy for kind of prompting us in the earlier panel and discussion. What struck me about this text is that there are at least three ways a, a kind of cultural dimension is at work. So in verse 8, we, we kind of have a kingdom culture. Paul is talking about what we do in our churches, in our worship, and men should pray. Men should pray. Brothers, y'all should be praying. Lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control and so on. And, and there Paul begins to sort of start to say some things that are kind of countercultural. So even where he says, verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, the positive weight of that verse is that a woman should be a disciple. She should be included in the instruction uh, and the mission of the church in that way. That's, that's countercultural for rabbinic Judaism and for the first century world. It's massively countercultural, right? But then his argument is transcultural. So when he roots this, he roots this in creation order. Right, so when he moves on down to verse 13, Adam was formed first and Eve, he's all the way back to our first parents, which is in part why I thought your talk, Bobby, was, was really quite helpful. Amen. So I think this issue of cultural engagement on complementarity or on gender and the roles, mm -hmm. I think there are multiple dimensions of culture at play. And we're tempted to sort of confuse our natural cultures with kingdom culture. And we're tempted to confuse our natural culture with being countercultural, and we just got some work to do to sort of untangle the two. So that's a long preamble. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is invite the sisters in first mm -hmm. to talk. So Judy, when you think about this notion of um, what the Bible teaches about male and female and roles and so on, talk with us about what you've seen in terms of things that appear to you to be cultural attachments rather than sort of biblical requirements. Yeah, uh, and before I get into that, I, I want to make sure to point out that 
if you really want to have a discussion where there's parity between different views, they need to be represented from the main stage equally, which is not what's going on here. But we can still have a discussion. And so I think... So, so point well made. I completely agree with you in principle. I'm sorry for interrupting you. But I just want to say, in fairness to the conference, we invited like seven female complementary or uh, egalitarian speakers to, to join us, and you, the sister, who were brave enough to come. <laughs> and so we, we we praise God for you. I agree with the point. I just don't. I want our best intentions represented. Yes, well absolutely. And, and I think you know, life happens and, and things happen. I mean, there are plenty of men who are egalitarian also, and I don't identify purely. <laughs> I don't identify purely as egalitarian or complementarian. I think that there are problems in each camp. It probably would take days of a conference dedicated to that to really unpack it fully. Uh, I just want to make sure that people don't walk away with this, this subtle impression that those who read the Bible and walk away with a complementarian understanding have the corner market on biblical exposition. Okay. So uh, if we want to talk about 1 Timothy 2, um, I think I'm bringing a sort of like bicultural like life experience into it, you know, like having looked at a group speaking two languages, Mandarin, Chinese, and English. And so even like looking at biblical translations, you know that it's like when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, if you were to translate that into Chinese, literally it would sound absurd because they need, the, the word rice is more appropriate there, right? Um, and so you need to understand that there are some things that you're just like, no, you changed the word bread. You know, like, it's like, but the meaning is still, you know, if you're really trying to translate the meaning. Um, and I think that, you know, we all are trying the best we can and based on our upbringing and our experiences, we bring different things to the text. We just do, which is why it's important to have humility. And the other thing is, this is a mixed crowd. You know, I can tell based on the, the comments that I received afterwards, right? And so we wanna be really careful in this space even, and I'm gonna address the audience. Um, when people say things you agree with, you're, you know, we're tempted to clap, whoop, you know, and that's a, that's a form of politicking, I think. Um, and so what that does is it puts us in competition with each other based on what views we have. And that, it's like, it's like the doggone like button on Twitter or favorite, you know, people get into an argument, I like this, I don't like that, you know, and it's like, it's like, you know, but at least in person, we can control the way that we choose to interact with each other. So, like, if we can, as a collective in this room, just kind of agree to exercise some self-control over the, even the way that we show agreement, I think that would go a long way to reconciliation, even if we never arrive at the same conclusions, right? So well, I look at this text missiologically uh, because, you know, I've traveled to all these different countries, ministered in different cultural contexts. I grew up in a cross-cultural family, multicultural marriage, you know, and so when you have, I'm trying to think, okay, in Middle Eastern culture, you know, if you go back to that passage where, you know, the Mary and Martha story where Martha's really upset that Mary is not helping her, it wasn't really that she was upset that she wasn't helping her. If you understand Middle Eastern culture, men and women did not sit together and learn from a rabbi together. They just didn't. And so Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, receiving teaching next to a man as if that were normal. And she's upset about that, you know? And so what's happened is now women are allowed to come and be, you know, students of the word. Um, and Paul's like, you know, here are some rules about wor worship propriety. You know, I don't think he's trying to establish a hierarchy as much as an order of worship based on the particular dynamics going on in the culture here. And so that's, all, that's the sort of eternal values. We are to have order in our worship, okay? Um, and so you have in the city this temple of Artemis. Women are priests and, you know, and you have, that's a pagan culture. And then you have traditional uh, Judaism, where you've got the separation of men and women, and men are, you know, learning from the rabbis, women are not. But now, men and women can all learn. But you're in the city where if pagan women are converted and they come into your church and they're used to goddess worship and, God, you know, women priestesses, and they haven't really learned anything about Judaism or anything, then they do need to be quiet and submit and not speak and learn first. 
And then, but, and then there's this whole idea of like, and just because you're allowed to come in and learn, that doesn't mean that I allow women now to lord it over the men. We're not gonna reverse it. So I think it, that makes a lot of sense to me when I look at that culturally. Amen. And as, as you're thinking um, about this sort of crossing cultural spaces, um, Chinese, white evangelical, um, other kinds of spaces, sort of coming forward now into our own day, what kinds of uh, other things do you think get attached to this notion of what it means to be male or female and, and how they relate that's cultural and not necessarily biblical? Yeah, um, gosh, that's a big question. I think that there's an important, well, there's a need for us to separate between, you know, really like what we use as conservative, which is, is kind of a loaded word now, approaching the text, versus traditionalism. You know, and sometimes we confuse traditionalism with, you know, biblical fidelity. We, ju we do. Um, and there's a lot of, like even Augustine in his paper on the Trinity from way back when, you know, he, he actually openly said that women are inferior to men. I mean, I mean, and the paper was really about the Trinity, but he happened to mention these things. And, but she, okay, so the man is the image of God, but women can bear the image of God if they get married to a man. And so you see some of the, the lingering inheritance of that kind of thinking, even if it's no longer attached to the original teaching, the attitude and the, the sort of subtle belief systems are still in place. So then women start to try to pursue identity in marriage or uh, men try to pursue identity in this whatever notion of manhood is put before them. What does it mean to be a man's man? Where did that come from? That's not biblical, right? So that's cultural. And, you know, or even like this idea of men are being too passive. You need to be out there. Well, are we actually prefer giving preference to people who are extroverts? Because not everyone has those gifts to go out there and like, rah, rah, take charge, take leadership. Some people are gifted to serve behind the scenes and ha they have gifts of mercy and, and gifts of generosity and administration. And so sometimes even our culture causes us to give preferential treatment to the spiritual gifts. Amen, well said. Jamie, I wanna pull you in as well. You, you, you've listened to um, talks that were supposed to be given, but not, talks that were given, <laughs> responses, and all that, you've heard it all, and, you, and you've been thinking in this area for a long time, uh, and discipling women and things of that sort. Uh, how would you answer that question about sort of cultural things that sometimes get confused for biblical things, or uh, another way of maybe putting it is the ways we sort of apply these things culturally um, as if those applications were all necessary biblically. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I actually have a lot of thoughts, um, but I'll only get a few. We, time is running short. Um, when I was first introduced to the idea of complementary, no term growing up, I mean, so introduced to it, and the way it was introduced culturally, um, the first thing in my mind was, you know what? My mother and that whole generation is going to hell. I mean, because of the way things were done. Um, as opposed to it being presented biblically where she is really the help fit. She was designed, she's equal. She's designed to come alongside of him to help him. Um, and being one of 11 children, she had to come alongside of him to help him, to feed the children, to care for the children, um, to provide housing for their children. Uh, and so the whole notion or idea of you have to be in the household, you're limited in how you can use your gifts and talents and abilities, um, it was just a paradigm shift growing up um, in a congregation, uh, traditional missionary Baptist, a uh, congregation where uh, not only were you encouraged to excel in academia, 
but you were also given the liberty and the freedom to excel with the gifts that God had given you for ministry as well, with the exception of preaching. I mean, that was clear. That was a clear demarcation. No preaching. But that was not even something that was not, we did not strive or even consider doing that then. Um, so to think culturally, I think it, one of the best examples I've heard was a young man at Trinity presenting um, when it came to the whole idea of diversity. It was you take this salad and all of its beautiful colors, the, the cranberries, the nuts, the lettuce. So you have all these beautiful colors, the tomatoes, the cucumbers, but yet you smother it in this white dressing. So while on the one hand we say diversity, but on the other hand it's smothered. And so when you introduce an idea like that and you smother cultures or ethnicities with it, it's like, no, everyone is not positioned where the mom can stay home. What do you do in those cases? Um, and so while I would like to say that my parents had 11 servants, <laughs> the kids, <laughs> but she came up, my mom came alongside my dad for the betterment of the household in order to advance the kingdom of God um, because we all were being reared up to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, and so it, the cultural dynamic is, it can be depressing if it's not properly presented, if it's not biblically presented, um, as opposed to this blanket concept of women keep silent, women are silenced, um, and it's a man, as James Brown would say, it's a man's world. <laughs> uh, but he also said it wouldn't be nothing without a woman <laughs> or a girl. Uh, so, and <laughs> so he took that straight from Genesis, I believe he did. But, uh, <laughs> He was following God in that. Uh, and <laughs> what an old rare moment. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it, it, and then to be, you know, to, to move past that and say, well, wait a minute now. No, this is not how God has posited this. God made this female, as Pastor Scott said earlier, to help. She's there. She's just equal. She's taking charge along with him. She's ruling alongside of him. And so, I, it, yeah, culturally it could be, if it's not properly presented, it could actually devastate households, and in particular, the, the woman, I think, more so. Well, can I, can I pull on that thread with, with, with you and Judy um, first, and then the brothers can jump in. Um, one of the critiques you get from folks who are not complementarians um, there are parts of this that's not fair, but I, I think we should receive it as a gift and think about it. Is, is some folks think um, inherently the notion of complementarity is abusive or patriarchal or oppressive. And while there are, are kind of apologetic responses we could give to that, uh, and we could point out that, well, egalitarian marriages are also marked by sin and so on, um, I think that would be the missed the blessing of thinking about ways in which that can be true or has been true. Uh, and so I would, you know, starting with Judy and Jamie, whichever you'd like to go first, I'd love to hear you guys sort of talk a bit about then the misapplications of this teaching that are, 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 are sinful, uh, whether that's expressed in uh, abuse or uh, oppression or suffocation or a range of things. You, you guys talk with us about that if you like. <laughs> I'll talk about it from the perspective of watching the little grand boys, our little grand boys, um, and being young and, and growing into maturity, but being young, their whole position is, I'm the man, I'm the boss, I know what's best. You're a girl. Hmm. Um, Those are Stephen's children. <laughs> I, see, I didn't name any names. I didn't name names. Um, and, and so that, that's sort of, uh, if, it's, if it's misrepresented, that's sort of what you get in the home. I'm the boss. I'm the man. You're the woman. Um, but 
I've seen it without a label from positive. When my mom died, my parents had been married 53 years. Um, and all of their shortcomings and failures, the household was a stable one. Um, we've been married 40 years, and Lou has a strong personality, but I do too. Uh, and the Lord has worked that out <laughs> under the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, it, uh, I've seen it from positive. My in-laws, the same thing, where um, their marriage, 40 plus years um, before my mother-in-law died, and it worked. Um, and I think what uh, Pastor Greer said earlier is that when you're willing to be obedient to the scripture, then God helps mm. you. Wow. Yeah. Do you need thoughts? Yeah. Um, I think that it does work for people, um, and, and I think that's wonderful. I don't think that's the only way um, to interpret Scripture or relationships, um, and I think that that's important to, to realize. Um, I'll speak on sort of Ephesians 5, which I feel like people use... It's a combination of Ephesians 5 and James 13. I'm going to kind of go back and forth. But uh, first in James 3, 14, um, ooh, where is it? It says, oh, um, he talks, he, or 16, he says, uh, warning against envy and selfish ambition. Right. So I think we can agree that for all Believers, no one is to have selfish ambition. And that means competition between men and women on who is supposed to be lording over what over whom, right? So it's interesting if you look at, I'm not a Greek scholar. It took like a year of biblical Greek when I was in college. So, But if you look in Ephesians 5, you know, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which he is the Savior. And then you just read the rest. The, the, uh, the verb, submit to your husbands, in the Greek is middle voice. We don't have that in English, but that is basically something you do to yourself. It is not something someone else does to you. And it is like, you know, hupo it's, it's like the locus of, of control resides in me. Okay, and so it's not up to a husband to force his wife to submit any more than it is for the wife to manipulate her husband into sacrificing himself for her, right? And when we talk about sacrifice, like Christ sacrificed himself for the church, we tend to have these, like, if, if someone's about to shoot or rape your wife, you'd be willing to die for her. Well, what about the daily things, you know, of sacrificing yourself for her instead of asking the women to both submit and sacrifice themselves for their husbands, right? So I think there's a lot of sort of deconstruction of our assumptions, that needs to be done, um, and I think that's where we have seen complementarianism be used as a weapon. Um, it sometimes it is actually very life-giving for a community, right? You give some examples there, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to deny that because I, I've seen that also, and I've also seen where it's oppressive, and I, I think that's where it's important to remember that we have to sort of let all the stories inform one another. And I think it's a certain freedom and understanding that um, the role of the wife or the woman is not submission. That's a posture that she takes. Um, and it, there's a freedom in that, in understanding that. And there's this mystery of the husband is the head of the wife, the way that Christ is the head of the church. And what does that word head mean? Some people think it means leader. Some people think it means source, but really neither one captures that. And, and it's like, that's why head, body, when a woman submits to the head, she's actually submitting to her own head. It's not submitting to her husband like he's some lord over her. And that's very different. That's where the profound mystery is. Um, and so it's, it's not hierarchy. I, I don't read that in the text. Well, it's hard to manage these panels within the time constraints, isn't it? Um, so I apologize for all the other speakers I've judged up to this point. Uh, <laughs> You're forgiven. <laughs> My goodness, uh, the time flies. Um, let, let me uh, thank Judy, Jamie, Bobby, 
and my brother Lou for leading us in this time and contributing to this time. Uh, let me let me go back to uh, thank Judy also for the comments uh, that you started the panel with about representation and things of that. So I don't want that to get lost. You were right uh, to make that point. It's a good point, and and it it, it leads me to want to say. Um, one or two things to close in, in about 15 seconds. One is I'm, I'm struck by how difficult these conversations about reconciliation are if you're trying to engage them on multiple fronts. I think we must engage them on multiple fronts. But it strikes me that some folks who are really comfortable talking about the sort of ethnic dimensions of that aren't nearly as skilled on the sort of gender side of it. And there are spaces where we talk about gender and those kinds of things, and we aren't nearly as skilled on the ethnic side or the class side and so on. Um, and so the, that, that kind of feedback which you were giving us earlier um, is vital. It's important that we, that we learn and grow um, to be skillful in multiple aspects of this conversation about reconciliation. And so thank you guys for um, contributing and blessing us in this way. Um, give it up for our panel here. Thank you.